Well, if you have a Bible with you tonight, please open, if you will, to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's about halfway through the Old Testament as I was praying about what God would have us study together tonight. Uh, he put on my heart to have us look together at one of the most dramatic, incredible, astounding stories in all of the Word of God. The title of the message tonight is, The Battle is the Lord's. The Battle is the Lord's. And the text we're going to look at is in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 22. The story is told about a young boy. He was in the second grade, and the children's ministry at the church that he was a part of announced that they were going to do a drama, a play, one Sunday night, and it would include all the famous scenes throughout the Bible, and different classes were chosen to play different dramatic events in the Bible, and this little boy's uh, second grade class was chosen to do the scene where Jesus comes out on the stormy sea of Galilee, and he meets his disciples uh, in the boat. And, of course, he says to them, peace be still, and so on. And this little boy was chosen to have the high honor and the great privilege of playing the part of Jesus. And he had one and only one line, the line, it is I, be not afraid. And so this little guy, he began to practice his line in the morning when he was having breakfast, it is I, be not afraid. When he was riding the bus to school, it is I, be not afraid. When he was having lunch, it is I, be not afraid. When he was on recess, it is I, be not afraid. On the way home, it is I, be not afraid. At dinner, it is I, be not afraid. The last thing he would say before he'd go to sleep, it is I, be not afraid. He, he was doing this for several weeks. And then came the night of the big production at his church, and different classes were doing their different scenes. And then it came turn for his class to do their scene. And all of his friends were out in the middle of the stage, and the lights were kind of uh, dim, and there was this cardboard makeshift boat that was there and all of his friends they were kind of rocking back and forth like they were in a stormy sea and so this little guy he comes out onto the stage to give his one and only line only when he gets out there he takes a look at the crowd and he has never seen so many people in all of his life and he just freezes with fear uh, he looks down on the front row and his mom is down there she's she's mouthing the words it is I be not a this little guy, it's just, he's still so petrified, he can't say anything. And the teacher, she's off the side of the stage, and she's trying to coach him along. It is I be not afraid, it is I be not afraid. But he's still so afraid, he can't say anything. And finally, he musters up enough courage that he blurts out, it's only me, and I'm scared to death. <laughs> I love that story. I don't know how many times in my life or your life that we have felt like that little boy. Before us in the Word of God tonight is the story of a man, a great man of God, who felt very much like that little boy. The date was 750 AD, uh, BC. The place was Jerusalem, and the man's name we want to talk to you about tonight was Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the fourth king of the southern kingdom of Judah, and that means that his great-great-grandfather was King Solomon. That name ought to be familiar with you as a student of the Bible because King Solomon is the one who built the most famous building in the Bible, the Temple of the Lord. It was great, it was impressive, and it was beautiful. And his great-great-grandson was Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was a good king. He was a godly king, and because of that, everything was going so well in the kingdom. But then in one day, everything changed. I don't know if you have discovered in your life the difference that one day can make sometimes. One day you can feel like you're on the top of the world, and the next day it can feel like your whole life is falling apart. One day it can seem like it is the best day of your life. The very next day it can seem like the worst day of your life. One day you can feel safe and secure and healthy and happy. And just one day later you can feel so lonely. 
and so overwhelmed and so afraid. And dear ones, if you ever feel like that, if you ever go through experiences like that, maybe some of you are here tonight and you feel like that, please know you are in good company because many of God's people have felt that way. Jehoshaphat felt that way. And his is a story that shows us what to do when you're in trouble. His is a story that shows us what to do when your world falls apart. His is a story that shows us what to do when it seems like everything is against you. Now, there are four things that happen as the story unfolds. And if you happen to have a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, I would highly encourage you just to jot these four things down. That way you can go back later and study through the story. And then maybe you can share what you've learned tonight with someone else that will be a blessing to them. The first thing that we see in the story as it unfolds before us is Jehoshaphat's problem. And that's what we see in verses 1 and 2. Look there at what the Word of God says. It says, And it happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon, and others with them besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazan Tamar, which is in Gedi, about 30 miles from Jerusalem. And Jehoshaphat was afraid. What was Jehoshaphat's problem? Well, we see here that enemies had risen up against him. Now, it's one thing if one enemy rises up against you. It's another thing if two enemies rise up against you. But here we see three enemies have risen up against Jehoshaphat. He is literally surrounded by enemies. Humanly speaking, he's in a totally impossible situation. And do you know what? Jehoshaphat's problem is often your problem, it's often my problem, because enemies can sometimes rise up the, against the people of God. Now, I'm not speaking about enemies with swords and spears or something like that. There are other kinds of enemies that rise up against us. There are financial enemies that rise up against the people of God. There are health enemies that rise up against the people of God. There are legal enemies that rise up against the people of God. There are relational enemies that rise up against the people of God. Jehoshaphat's problem is often your problem. It's often my problem. And I'm sure that what might have made things even worse for Jehoshaphat is that he was a good king. He was a godly king in in our minds, we sort of reason that, you know, if a person is a bad person and bad things happen to bad people, then that makes sense to us. But whenever a bad things happen to good people, to God's people, then we begin to ask that question, why? Why, Lord? I've been so faithful to you. I've honored your name. I've walked in the ways of the Lord. Why, oh God, would you allow these enemies to rise up against me? Dear ones, if you ever ask that question, know that God has an answer. <laughs> the reason why that God would sometimes allow those enemies to rise up against us is because he wants us to learn to depend on him and only him. Not on other people, not on other things. Why would he allow enemies to rise up against us so that when we get in these impossible situations and we look to him, we see with our own eyes what the power of God can do. We see with our own eyes, as we sang tonight, that our God is a way maker and that nothing is too hard for him, that nothing is impossible for the Lord. Why? 
Why does he allow us to get in these kinds of situations? So that we will turn the reins of our life over to him. The story is told about the godly farmer, and this farmer had a young teenage boy, and the farmer was increasingly concerned about his son because as his son was getting older, his son was getting more and more rebellious. He was getting more and more stubborn. He was getting more and more independent. And this young teenager acted like he didn't need anybody's help. And his father was so concerned because he knew it was going to affect his relationship with other people and it was going to affect his relationship with God. And he was really praying for his son. And he was asking the Lord, Lord, could you just show me how I can help my son? And, and one day he had an idea. He believed that God gave him an idea. And he just, he said to his son, he said, hey, would you like to go for a ride out in the buckboard wagon? And his son said, oh, that would be awesome. And so they hitched up a team of horses to the buckboard wagon and down the road they went. And as they're driving along together, the father says to the son, uh, would you like to drive? Would you like to take the reins? Well, this independent, rebellious, overconfident son, sure, of course. <laughs> And so his father hands him the reins. Well, the instant that he handed him the reins, those horses could sense the insecurity of this young man. And all of a sudden, they shot off like a rocket down the road. And brrr, they're going faster and faster and faster. And the faster they're going, the more and more panicked this young teenager becomes until finally, at one point, he says, Dad, you take the reins. And his dad took the reins and slowed the horses down. He stopped the wagon. And he began to talk to his son from his heart. And he said, son, I'm so concerned about you. You think you don't need anyone's help. You think you don't need God's help. But you do need God's help. Why? Why would God allow circumstances, enemies, to rise up against you and me? Because he wants us to learn to run to him, to go to him, and only him, to depend on him to deliver us and no one else. Well, that brings us to a second thing that we see in our story, and that is Jehoshaphat's prayer. Jehoshaphat's prayer, that's what we see in verse 3 to 13. Why would God allow problems to come? Because it drives us to him. What do you do when enemies rise up against you? What do you do when your world falls apart? What do you do when it seems like everything is against you? You run to God in prayer. In verse 1 again, And it happened after this to the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others besides the Ammonites. They came to battle against Jehoshaphat. And some came and told him, A great multitude is coming against you. So what did Jehoshaphat do? Verse 3 says, And Jehoshaphat was afraid. So he set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, in the house of the Lord, before the new court. What did Jehoshaphat do when enemies had risen up against him? He began to pray. He began to call out to God in prayer. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Psalm 50 and verse 15, where God says this to you and me. He says, call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Listen, Jehoshaphat knew where to find help. He began to pray and seek the Lord. And not only did he begin to pray, he got everybody else to pray with him. 
as many people throughout the land as who could begin to pray, they began to pray. And where were they praying? Notice verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord, in the house of the Lord before the new court, the house of the Lord. What was the house of the Lord? <laughs> it wasn't a church building like this. The house of the Lord for Jehoshaphat was the temple. <laughs> the temple that his great-great-grandfather Solomon had built. And something amazing happened when his great-great-grandfather Solomon dedicated the temple. Solomon prayed a prayer. And the essence of the prayer is this. O oh Lord... If enemies ever rise up against your people, if your people are ever in trouble and they come into the house of the Lord to cry out to you, O oh God, hear and answer their prayer. And when Jehoshaphat was in trouble, when enemies had risen up against him, he knew where to find help. Help was in the house of the Lord. Dear ones, I'm so glad you're here tonight in the house of the Lord. This is where hope is found. This is where help is found. This is where answers are found to go to the house of God and to begin to call on the name of the Lord with all of your heart in faith, knowing that he's promised that when you call on his name, he will hear and answer you. And so Jehoshaphat, he begins to pray in verse 6. And oh, oh, what a prayer he prayed. In verse 6, and he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to stand, withstand you? Notice how he begins his prayer. He, he says, O oh Lord God of our fathers. I love that name of God. I love that title of God. As students of the Bible, you know that there are many names of God in the Bible. He's called Elohim. He's called El Elyon. He's called El Shaddai. He's called Jehovah. He's called Jehovah Jireh. He's called all these many different names. But though Jehoshaphat could have chosen any one of those names, he didn't. Instead, he began his prayer by praying, O oh God of our fathers. Why did he use that name of God? I believe he used that name of God because he was going back to the fact that whenever God's people called on him, God answered their prayers. Oh God, oh God, when Noah was in trouble, he called out to you and you answered his prayer. Oh God, when Abraham was in trouble and he called out to you, you answered his prayer. Oh God, when Joseph was in prison and he called out to you, you heard and answered his prayer. Oh Lord, when Moses and the people were groaning under bondage in Egypt, they called out to you and you answered their prayer. Oh God, when, Jeho when Joshua was in trouble and he called out to you, you heard and answered his prayer. Oh God, when David was in trouble with that giant Goliath, he called on your name and you heard and answered his prayer. Oh God of our fathers, oh God, who's always heard and answered the prayers of your people, he says, are you, verse 6, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? What was he saying? He was saying, oh God of our fathers, I thank you that you are still on the throne. Dear ones, I've come with a good word from God for you tonight. God is still on the throne. No matter what is happening in your marriage, no matter what is happening in your health, no matter what is happening in your finances, no matter what is happening in the world, God is still on the throne. Jehoshaphat prays and he says, O oh Lord, who's always answered prayer, 
I know that you are still ruling and reigning from on high. And then verse 7, are you not our God? <laughs> oh, I like that. Your God is not just the God of people long ago and far away. He's the living God. <laughs> He's the God of today. He's the God of now. He's your God and my God. Oh God, who's always answered prayer. Oh God, who's still on the throne. Oh, you are our God. Verse 7, are you not our God? Who drove out all the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it and have built a sanctuary in it. What sanctuary? The temple. The temple that Solomon built and dedicated to the Lord. And now he's going to quote from his great-great-grandfather's prayer. He's going to quote from 2 Chronicles 6, where Solomon said, If disaster comes upon a sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and we will cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear. And you will save. And then I like this. When he prays, he doesn't pray in generalities. He gets very specific. This is my enemy. This is exactly what I'm facing in my life, God. And I'm going to call on your name and let you know. He says here, verse 10, And now here are the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are. They're rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. And then verse 12. And then verse 12. It is a verse that you ought to have circled in your Bible. You ought to have a star by this verse one of the most important verses in all of the Word of God. Verse 12, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. Pause right there for a moment. I'd like you to underline two phrases that we just read together. Underline the phrase, we have no power and underline the phrase, nor do we know what to do. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there tonight. Maybe you're there right now. Lord, we have no power. I can't fix this. The lawyers can't fix it. The accountants can't fix it. The doctors can't fix it. God this is impossible. I have no power. And I don't know what to do. Lord, I've talked to this person. I've talked to that person. I've talked to the other person. God, I've even Googled it and I still don't know what to do. <laughs> what do you do when you have no power? What do you do when you don't know what to do? Oh, the next phrase is so great. You ought to underline it and put a huge star by it. We have no power and we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Oh, I love that so much. Lord, we're not looking at the circumstance. We're not looking at the situation. We're not looking at the enemies. We're not like Peter out on the water and we're looking at the stormy water and about to sink. No, our eyes, Lord, are upon you, dear ones. When you have no power and you don't know what to do, look to the Lord. Look to him. Let your eyes go above your circumstance and your situation to the one that is ruling and reigning on high. Oh, we have no power and we don't know what to do. 
but our eyes are upon you. When I was a little boy growing up in church, we would go to our little Sunday school classes and often before we would do our lesson, we would sing these little choruses and there was one chorus that we would sing quite often and after all these years, I still remember these words. They sometimes go around and around in my mind. The words, got any rivers you think are uncrossable. Got any mountains you can't tunnel through. God specializes in the things thought impossible. And he can do for you what no one else can do. What do you do when it seems like everything is against you? What do you do when your world falls apart? What do you do when enemies rise up against you? What do you do? You go to the house of the Lord and you begin to call out to him in prayer. And notice, if you will, verse 15 or verse 13. Now all Judah and with their little ones and their wives and their children, they stood before the Lord. Do you see it? Are you there? They're in trouble, and so they go to the house of God. And there they are, young and old, men and women, the wives, the children. They're just all standing there in the house of the Lord. They're calling out to God in prayer. Oh, Lord, we're in trouble. We're really in trouble. Please hear us, Lord. Please rescue us. Please save us. Please deliver us. If there ever was a moment they needed to hear from God, it was in that moment. And all of a sudden, they heard from God. The third thing that happens in the story is Jehoshaphat's promise. That's what we see in verse 14 through 19. There they are. They're all waiting on the Lord in prayer. In verse 14, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, in you, O King Jehoshaphat. Verse 14 again, the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel. Now, perhaps many of you have a good question tonight, and that is the question, who in the world is Jehaziel? <laughs> I mean, I, I've heard of Elijah, I've heard of Elisha, I've heard of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Zechariah, but Jehaziel... <laughs> Who in the world is Jehaziel? Well, interesting. We do not hear of this prophet before this time. and We do not hear of this prophet after this time. He's an obscure, unknown prophet. But we do know what his name means. The name Jehaziel means our eyes are on the Lord. I find it so wonderful that when God's people are in trouble and they go to the house of the Lord and they begin to pray and they say, we have no power and we don't know what to do, all of a sudden the Spirit of God comes on this ordinary servant that nobody knows, whose name means our eyes are on the Lord and he begins to prophesy the word of God to the people and he says in verse 15, Listen, all you Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid or dismayed because of this multitude. Underline that phrase, do not be afraid. Do you know that phrase occurs 103 times in the Bible? You get the idea God doesn't want us to be afraid. I'll learn on that phrase, nor be dismayed. That phrase is found 54 times in 
the Bible. Don't be afraid because of the enemies. And then notice this phrase. Do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude. Underline this next phrase. Put a star by this next phrase. For the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. Dear ones, I don't know what circumstance or situation you might be in tonight. All I know is as I was praying and waiting on the Lord about what he wanted us to study tonight, he so strongly put on my heart, go to Chino Valley and have them open the word of God to 2 Chronicles 20. Have them underlined in their Bible. We have no power. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Have them underline, the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. I don't know what battle you might be facing tonight. All I know is my Bible is open in front of me, and the Word of God says to you, the Word of God says to me, whatever that battle is, you're not going to have to fight it. The Lord's going to fight that battle. Oh, I like this. The battle is not yours, but the Lord's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the, the brook before the wilderness of Zer Jeruel. And you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Right now, I'd like you to circle something else in your Bible. I'd like you to circle the two words, stand still. Stand still. As a student of the Bible, maybe you remember those words. If you've read through the Bible, you've seen them before. They were the exact words that God spoke to Moses. When the children of Israel were in trouble, you remember, God brought them out of Egypt by the ten plagues by a mighty hand, and they came down to the Red Sea, and as they're camped there, all of a sudden, the Pharaoh changes his mind, and he brings all of his horses and his chariots. They're bearing down on the children of Israel. You talk about being in a no-win situation. You talk about enemies rising up against you. You talk about being between a rock and a hard place. That's where they were. And they began to cry out to the Lord. And God said to them, Stand still and watch. Just watch what I will do. Why does God allow us to get into difficult situations? Sometimes because he wants us to just watch what he can do. So you will watch him bear his arm and fight on your behalf. So you will watch him do what seems utterly impossible in your mind, in your heart. Oh, I like this. He says in verse 17, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I like this. Who is with you. The Lord is with you. As we sang tonight, even when you don't see him, he's working. He's still working. Even when it seems like he's far away, he's not far away. He is right there with you, even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He will fear no evil, for the Lord is with you. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O oh, Jeru Ju Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is is with you. Oh, what a promise. <laughs> what a promise. Jehoshaphat and the people, they went to the temple of the Lord and they were waiting on the Lord in prayer. <laughs> they needed to hear from God and all of a sudden, they didn't expect what was going to happen. An unknown spokesman brought the word of God to them. Faith began to rise in their hearts. And verse 18 says, And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord. They were worshiping the Lord. You see it? Are you, are you there? They were standing and the word of God came to them. And they all just started getting down on their knees. Jehoshaphat got on his face. I, 
I don't know what he said. It's not recorded for what he said. I, I just know what I would say. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Lord, I had lost hope. I didn't know what to do. I was so far in over my head. I just needed to know you were there, God. I just needed to know that you were going to fight on my behalf. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But then something amazing happened. Notice verse 19. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites, they stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with their voices lifted high. All of a sudden, people are worshiping God and all of a sudden, just spontaneously, leaders started standing all over the place. They just began to stand all on their own. No one asked them to do it. They just started to stand. It's like, why did they do that? They were standing in faith. <laughs> they were standing on what God had promised. They, they were doing what the old timers call standing on the promises. See, God's word is filled with exceeding great and precious promises, 2 Peter 1 and verse 4 says. The book that you're holding in your hands is not just a history book. It's not just a devotional book. It's not a theology book. It's a promise book. Did you know they tell us that in the Bible there are 5,467 promises. I have a word for that. Wow! Wow! And those exceeding great and precious promises are for you. They're for me. Listen, never read the Bible without a pen in your hand. I, I always read the Bible with a pen in hand, and I'm always asking the Lord, you speak to me from your word. And, you know, maybe you're in a financial difficulty, and all of a sudden you come on Philippians 4 and by, verse 19, and my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I write in the margin next with, thank you, Lord, that one's for me. <laughs> that one's for me. Maybe you're facing a health crisis or circumstance or situation that's beyond you and then you come across Exodus 15 and verse 26 where God says I am the Lord that healeth thee oh oh thank you Lord so much there's your word to me maybe you're a, you're a mom at home with little kids running all over the place and you are just bone tired and weary all of a sudden you come on Isaiah chapter 40 verse 30 when those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll man up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. That one's for me. You're reading along and you're in a tough place and all of a sudden your eyes land on Psalm 46.1. The Lord is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. As you read the Bible, look for those promises. And when you find those promises, stand on those promises. I like an old hymn called Standing on the Promises. Mm -hmm. The hymn writer wrote, Standing on the Promises, I Cannot Fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. The Course says standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. This is exactly what the people of God were doing so many centuries ago. But there's a fourth and final thing that we see in this story, and that is Jehoshaphat's plan. That's what we see in verse 20 to 22, and it is one of the craziest plans you can ever imagine. 
Verse 20, so they arose early in the morning and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Jerusalem, and you inhabitants of uh, uh, hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe in his prophets and you will prosper. Underline that word believe. Twice you see it there. Believe in the Lord and believe in his prophets. What's that? The word of God. So Jehoshaphat gets all the people together and he says, God's spoken to us and we're going to believe God and we're going to believe the word of God. So much so that verse 21 says, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who would sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness. And they went out before the army. They were singing, praise the Lord. His mercy endures forever. That was his plan. Now that's the craziest plan I ever heard of. I don't know if you would have been alive at that time, whether you would like to have been one of the singers out in the front, facing all the swords and spears and all of that. It's the choir that won a war. <laughs> Why? They understood there was great power in praising the Lord in the circumstance and situation that you're in. Martin Luther wrote a great hymn. A mighty fortress is our God. In that hymn, he says, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to us, undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us, the prince of darkness grim. We tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word, one little song by the believers shall fell him. I like a song we sometimes sing called I Raise a Hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than my unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Jehoshaphat knew what to do. Just begin to worship the Lord. Just begin to praise the Lord. And I like his doing this because it shows he really believed God. God said, stand still and you'll see my salvation. And Jehoshaphat believed that. They didn't take up swords. They didn't take up spears. They didn't seek out other armies to help them. They just stood still with the praise of God on their lips, knowing that what God had promised, he would be faithful to do. Well, what happened is they began to raise their hallelujah. Verse 22 says, now when they began to sing, the moment they began to sing, and praise the Lord. The Lord set ambushes. The Hebrew literally reads ambushers. Probably angelic hosts from the God of angel armies come to fight for the children of Israel. They set ambushers against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were defeated. And verse 27 says, And they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem. Notice, with joy, such joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. God had fought for his people. God had won the victory. They had believed in the Lord. And he did what seemed utterly impossible to them. And what God did for them, he can do for you. He can do for me. When I was growing up, my uh, precious mama used to sing around the house all the time. She was doing the housework and she would sing this song and that song and a song that she probably sang more than anything was a little song called Faith in God. 
she would sing, faith in God can move a mighty mountain. Faith in God can calm a troubled sea. Faith in God can make the desert like a fountain. Faith in God will bring the victory. It brought the victory for Jehoshaphat and the people of God. And God will bring the victory for you and for me. Dear ones, as we gather together tonight, I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know your circumstance and your situation. I just know that as I was praying about what to share with you, the Lord put this passage on my heart so much. Go over to Chino Valley and remind them, when you have no power and you don't know what to do, put your eyes on the Lord. Go over there and remind them, fear not, nor be dismayed, because the Lord is with you. Go over there and remind them, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Go over there and remind them that the battle is the Lord's. Dear ones, I've come with a good message for you tonight. No weapon formed against God's people is ever going to prosper. Dear ones, I've come with a good message for you tonight that if God is for you, there's nobody who can ever be against you. I've come with a good message tonight. The battle is the Lord's. Can we give our king a great applause tonight? Because the battle belongs to him.